Because like I can remember, you know, like I needed somebody to show me the love of God way back when, when I didn't have nothing, you know, I didn't have nowhere to go. And praise God, my sister showed me love, you know, and uh, that's that's what this is all about. Really, that's ultimately the product of God is love. Amen. And actually, that, that's the title of my message this morning. I, I kind of got to be honest with you. A lot of times the way God gives me my messages is that it's just a quick download. Sometimes it's just a word, a verse, a character in the Bible. But it's always there. It's always present. I always know when it happens. It happens sometimes during the week. Sometimes somebody says something. And I'm like, that's what I'm preaching on right there. Bam, because the Lord shows me. This time it was, I don't know, it was different. And it was a little bit of more of a struggle. You know how you hear those preachers like, man, I was wrestling with the Lord to get the word. It was a little bit more like that. But in the end, I wasn't even sure. And in the end, the message had to do with love and then I mean we come in here this morning and all the music is is you know showing you know going bringing us in that direction and so I feel I feel good about the message this morning and that's the title of my message is the product of his work it's love amen let's go to first Corinthians chapter 13 and let's go ahead and read um, read this passage of scripture you know I was sharing with Robert before church started, y'all don't laugh at me, but I was sharing with him like, dude, if people keep showing up at church, we're going to have to go to two services. Not just because of the fact that the church is growing, but because of the fact of the times that we live in. They start driving up and they see the parking lot the way that it is, and they drive in. And, you know, Robert assures me that we can handle at least 60 people. So if we start having more than 60 on a regular basis, if everybody showed up that comes to church here, we would we would be there. So it's something that we're going to have to at least think about as time goes forward. I'm not trying to push you in that direction. I'd rather just keep it the way that it is. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't want to lose what we have, but it's just something to actually think about. All right, here we go. Chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself. In other words, it doesn't elevate itself and put itself forward. And it's not puffed up, meaning prideful. It does not behave itself unseemly, or we could say in an improper way. It doesn't seek her own. Charity is not easily provoked, and it thinks no evil. Rejoy it doesn't rejoice in iniquity or sin, but instead it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. In other words, it puts up with all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Charity never fails. But where there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just offer myself up as a vessel to you, really just a mouthpiece. You've, your word says that you've chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Lord, you have chosen this gospel message and you know it. And we're even going to cover it this morning. You knew that the world and all of its intellect and all of its pomp and circumstance and all of the mindset that it has regarding what success looks like was going to look at this message that you offered man and think that it was silly 
think that it was low, think that it was ugly, think that it was dirty. But you have chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise, Lord God. You, you, you are altogether different than mankind. Lord God, you, your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts, oh Lord God. You thought it was necessary to have the King of Kings and Lord of Lords born in a, as a baby in a manger amongst stinky animals whenever human kings are born in royal palaces wearing silk clothing. You, Lord, had your king ride into town on a donkey when kings that were known according to the world rode on white stallions. The way that you see things are completely different than the way that the world perceives things and your love is completely different than the love we understand. Holy Spirit, we need your help this morning. Yes. I need your help to explain, Lord God, and to speak the things that you've called me to speak. But Lord, even more than that, we all need your help, Lord God, to truly understand what you're trying to say to us this morning, Lord. Without revelation from your Holy Spirit, we'll never understand it. So we pray that you would help us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the word charity in this chapter is actually the translation for the word agape, which is God kind of love. Now, agape love, really, if you were going to look at the strict Greek definition of it it, it, it describes the fact that God's love understands the value of the object being loved. What that means is, is that God understands your value. God understands my value. And the value that God set upon you and me is the life of Jesus. Because God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but instead they would be able to have everlasting life. So that's God's love. God's love is sacrificial in nature. God's love is selfish in nature. Many times in our mind and in the world that we live in, we're very confused on what we think love would look like. As a matter of fact, human love at its best is, is usually actually very self, selfish instead of selfless. I'm not calling you out. I'm just telling you. I know. I don't need it. I mean, Lord, Lord, help me help my personality not to be rude. I don't want to be rude. But I'm just saying, like, I understand because I am a human being and I have experienced this. Right, right. That, that even at my best, whenever I felt like I was loving, like, more like God, still there were motives in my head and in my heart where I was wondering, like, so what am I going to get out of this? If I'm going to give you something, if I'm going to wash your back, I need you to wash my back. Our love at its best is prid quo pro, however you say that word. In other words, I wash your back, you wash mine. I give you something, you give me something. What are we going to get in exchange for this deal? But that's not the way that God loved. Hallelujah. God gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but instead would have everlasting God. God emptied heaven of its most prized possession. Amen. And when we get a revelation of that love, it'll begin to transform our heart. It'll begin to transform our life. This is how that they're going to know. This is how the glory of God will be revealed through your love. When God's love is produced in us, it comes out of us in a whole different way. That's the agape of God. Amen. The charity of God that, that you know, and it's interesting that the King James translators would choose to translate it as charity because in reality, the charity is when you give to someone who is in need. And God's love gave to people that were in need. God's love continues to give to people in need. Whenever you face situations when you feel as though people don't deserve your love, can I tell you something? That's a perfect example in time when you need to realize that that's a person in need of your love. See, the enemy would come. We've already mentioned so many times in the messages that we've preached that that whenever we're in a war or we're in a conflict, I'm talking about in our daily lives, that we're not warring against flesh and blood, but instead principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Meaning, even if you get in a conflict with someone at work, if you get in a conflict with a family member, it's not really that person that you're in conflict with. You're, you're in conflict with the spiritual entities that are using that person as a vessel. Whether it was somebody that you thought loved you, whether it's somebody that you feel like hates you, it's neither here nor there. You know, they, and it might be somebody that loves you. It might be the preacher. 
I might say something to you, not meaning to, that offends you. And the enemy will be so quick to come back and to say, look what he said. He's supposed to be the preacher. Why would you even want to go to that church? Do you know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one that the devil tries to whisper in my ear? I'm tired of his games. I'm tired of the way that he plays the game. I'm starting to catch on to him and his little tactics and understand that his whispers are lies and that I need to learn to love the truth. So God loved humanity and the value of this love, amen, was the life of Jesus. God is love. Let's take a look at 1 John uh, chapter, I didn't even put the, put the chapter here. Let's see here. 1 John chapter, I believe it's chapter 4, verse 1. No, verse 7. 1 John, let me pull out my old Bible. Look. Forgive me because I've gotten so spoiled with my iPhone and my iPhone broke. And so I had to prepare my message old school. All right, here we go. First John chapter four, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Amen. He's saying, and I wanted you to get a revelation of this word when it says beloved. You know what that word means? It means the one that is loved of God. And that's that's really what that song was saying this morning, that the father loves you, that that's your name. You are the beloved of God. And we need a revelation from God to know that. Amen. Because because the the world and, and, and the things that happen to us in, in this world cause pain and hurt and sorrow and heartache. And we don't and we and we have a hard time believing that God truly does love us because other people hurt us. Look at verse 11. Skip down to verse 11 through 13. It says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, then God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. In other words, no man has ever seen God face to face. Moses was the closest one to see God. Now, when we saw Jesus, when they saw Jesus, we saw God. But what he's saying is, is no man's ever seen God. But listen, when the love of God is perfected in us and it flows out of us, people actually see God in our lives. That's how they're going to see the invisible God that you and I say we serve. That's what the song actually said was that your glory, I know I keep saying it, will be revealed, but it's revealed through the love that we have for one another. You know, they say that John the Beloved, who wrote these letters, wrote the Gospel of John, also wrote the book of Revelation while he was on the Isle of Patmos. He was the oldest disciple to live. He was in his 90s is what they say. And church tradition says that towards the end, you know, they would have church sometimes outside. And they would literally carry him because he couldn't walk. And they would bring him and they'd prop him up under a tree. And what he would say with tears flowing down his face is, do what the master said and love one. And it would be probably so powerful if you could imagine the anointing of the one who loved the Lord so much. Amen. And, 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 and as he would just say that and just talk about the love of God, I just wish that there was, I wish, amen, Holy Spirit, we need your help to reveal that love to us. The anointing that would reveal that to us. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Did you know that when you got saved, if you didn't know this, I need to proclaim this to you this morning. That if you're born again, if you're not born again, you need to get born again. But if you're born again, if you're saved this morning, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. That means God moved in. God moved into your heart, amen, and God is love, therefore the love of God is in you, amen, and God wants his love to come out of you. But I got to tell you that, and I've already said it, but God's love is so foreign, foreign to what this world offers, it's so foreign to our fallen natures that it's very difficult for us to understand God's love, because once again, we've been enculturated. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Some of you that have been coming to church with me for a while, I use this terminology all the time, so it's nothing new to you. But when I say enculturated, we've been trained by those around us. Does that make sense? Yeah. We were trained by our family. Maybe mommy and daddy didn't really love us the way that God would have wanted to love us. I can say that my mama definitely tried. Thank you, mom. <laughs> uh, you know, that our parents might not have loved us the way that God would have intended for another human being to love another human being. 
the whole music world, I always go back to the music, whether you like it or not. I'm not over here trying to poke you in the eye, but if you keep on listening to secular music and you learn how to love the way the world's singing for you to learn how to love, you ain't going to be loving the way the Lord loves, brothers and sisters. Because the world's music is telling you to love a whole different way. It's not even love. It's really built on lust. It's built on what I'm going to get out the deal, and I need to get what I got coming to me right now. And even whenever they use the word love, it's not God kind of love. Right. It's still all about romantic. It's the word eros in the Greek, and that word isn't even in the Bible. I'm not trying to say that God doesn't want you want married couples to be romantic. That's not the issue. But that right there does not give us a revelation of the love of God. Amen. And so because of the music industry, because of the world, because of the people that we're around, we're enculturated and we have a hard time understanding what love really looks like. And until we get a relationship with the Lord and allow God's love to overwhelm our heart, we're going to have a hard time understanding that. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. And whenever you read it on the front, on the surface, you don't really get the whole importance of the scripture. So you've got to kind of dig a little deeper. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed, or you could say poured on us, or given us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Now, you know, just give me a second because I want to talk to you about that word manner for a moment. But before I even do that, I want you to see this. The world knows us not because it knows him not. The world can, when you start to operate in the true love of God, the world will not understand. Do you realize that when you try sometimes to talk to the world about the things of God, they don't understand because, again, the natural mind, and we're going to get into that in a moment also, the natural mind cannot perceive the things of God. Because the things of God are spiritually understood. But I want you to see that word manner right there because that word manner actually in the original language, it describes something that came from another place, like another tribe. Like in other words, what I'm trying to say is, well, you remember the story of Tarzan. I don't know why this popped in my head, but let's use the story of Tarzan. Greystoke Tarzan. The story goes that a young boy was lost in the jungle, right? He was raised by animals, correct? And then all of a sudden, these civilized people show up and they find this Tarzan as a grown man. Come to find out he's an heir to some very powerful and rich people. So what do they do? They take him from this land and they bring him to where he supposedly was from. But he's like, what? what? I'm in the midst of a foreign land. I've never seen, I don't understand how to function in this land. What I'm here to tell you is, is that what this scripture is saying is that God's love is not like that at all, but kind of like that concept. <laughs> you, you understand? Because it came from another place. And we have never seen that kind of love. Because see, you and I were born of Adam and we were born in sin. And sin has perverted our mindset and messed up our understanding of the love of God. And the world is perverted because of sin. And it continues to mess up and train us according to its ways. But then God sent his love to us in Jesus. And now when the gospel message is preached and you and I hear it and we believe by faith, God places his spirit on the inside of us and God is love. And if we will yield to that and yield to his word and learn to walk in his ways each and every day a little bit more, we will learn about the love of God. Amen. And it will start to move us in the right direction. The context of the love chapter is found and we won't understand it until we look at the whole letter. We need to understand a little bit about the whole letter. There's multiple places in the letter where Paul addresses the selfish attitudes of the believers in the Corinthian church. You know, Corinth was an island in the Mediterranean. I usually draw maps. I'm not going to get into that this morning. But it was an island near Greece. And just to give you a little bit of a, of a history lesson on Corinth, it was worse than New Orleans. It was like worse than Bourbon Street. Let's put it that way. Now, when I say worse than Bourbon Street, like, hold on, preacher. I kind of like Bourbon Street. Well, you know, look, Bourbon Street ain't nothing like the church. Bourbon Street isn't Amen. nothing like the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. All right. So, so Bourbon Street is all about, you know, they got houses of ill repute all up and down the street, you know, strip clubs and People doing drugs and people drinking and we all know the smells that go along. And at Corinth was 
was made New Orleans look like a nursery school. Corinth had a temple with over a thousand temple prostitutes in it. That's how they worship God in their false gods. Okay, and, and, and the sailors would come into the harbors and the temple prostitutes would come down and, 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 and then this is the way that they lived their life. So this church was established in the midst of all of this. And so all I'm trying to say is, is that these people are getting saved. But do you realize and do you understand that even though you're saved, you can still operate with a natural mindset? And you can still have a lot of the world in you when in reality we should be having more and more of Christ in you. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on, somebody. A preacher ain't the only one that has gotten saved and has still acted more like the world than like Jesus. Right? It doesn't mean that we're not saved. It doesn't mean that the love of God has not come into our heart. But we're not yielding to the will of God. And instead, we're allowing the world to still be manifest in our life. And many times when that happens, guess what? We're still selfish. The love of God is the cross. The love of God was displayed for mankind at the cross. That was the most selfless act that anybody could have ever given. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. When you and I had done God wrong, guess what he did in response? Sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Now just stop for a second. Because you and I need the Holy Spirit to give us a revelation of that. Because, I mean, it sounds, it sounds real touching when you say it, but no, we really need to be touched by it. I said, when you did your worst towards God, I don't typically try to get people to remember the worst thing they ever did. Because really and truly, God wants to throw that stuff in the sea of forgiveness. He wants to get rid of all that. He wants to throw that away. He wants your sin to be as far to the left as it is to the right. But what I'm trying to say is this. Whatever that thing that plagues you, whatever that thing that tries to shame you, whatever that thing that tries to make you live under guilt, I'm here to tell you it's a lie. Because at that moment in time is when God sent Jesus specifically to die for you. Whatever the worst was, because that's the kind of love that God has for you. That's the kind of love that God has for me. But these Corinthians, see, you know what's interesting is, is that whenever you look, in, especially in Pentecostal type churches like what we are, we're Pentecostal in case you didn't know that. What does that mean? We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. We believe in that. And let me just say this, is that many times people that go to a church like that, whether it's a full gospel church, people that still believe in the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, they're looking for gifts. And they're like, man, I wish our church looked like Corinth. And I'm here right now to tell you that I want the gifts of God flowing in the midst of our church. I believe in the gifts of the spirit. I believe in the gift of prophecy. I believe in the gift of a word in tongues that's interpreted in English so that you and I can get a word from the Lord. I believe God wants to speak that way. But when you use Corinth as an example, you need to slow down for a second because, yes, they were flowing in the gifts. But Paul said you're carnal. You're carnal and I couldn't even feed you meat. I could only give you milk because you weren't mature enough to receive the milk, the meat. What he was saying is, is that you flow in all of these gifts, but basically you're selfish because he says in 1 Corinthians 1.11 that the household of Chloe informed him that you got strife and bickering amongst you because you like this preacher over that preacher over this preacher over that preacher. You're carnal. Not, I didn't die for you. Paul said, I didn't die for you. Peter didn't die for you. No, Jesus died for you. We're over here preaching the message that God gave to us to preach to you. And it's a message that should result in you getting closer to the Lord. Amen. In chapter uh, 11, verse 18, Paul explains also that they were divided when they came to take communion. Y'all have heard me talk about that before. That basically the rich people would show up before the poor people and they'd eat all the bread and drink all the wine. And then the poor people would show up and they're like, oh, sorry, we don't have anything. Well, that's not communion. Communion is a common union between believer and Jesus and between all of us together. And we partake of that together to remind ourselves that Jesus died on the cross and that that's what brought us together. Amen. So the message that the apostle preaches is the opposite of the behavior of the church. The apostles preaching a message of love and forgiveness and kindness. But the Corinthian people are living in the midst of selfishness. Right. And they're not. They, 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 the, the love of the cross is one of sacrifice and selfless love. And the behavior of the church is selfishness and self-seeking. Let's look at 
1 Corinthians 1.18. Because I, <clears throat> I'm just trying to explain to you how the gospel, how the power of God, how the will of God is interconnected with the love of God. And how it's so different than what we perceive love to be. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now that word preaching there literally can be translated as message. It can be translated as word. So the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. It's very important that you understand this. That the, that the message of the cross contains within it the very power of God. Why? Well, let me give it to you real quick. Because what Jesus did at the cross was he paid the penalty for your sin. He took your sin, my sin, upon himself and he paid the debt, the price that was owed to God because mankind had sinned. He took that sin and that guilt upon himself and when he died, he paid the wage of sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when Jesus died and took our guilt, guess what? There was a transference that took place. He took our guilt and he gave us the righteousness of Jesus. When you got saved, the Holy Ghost came to live on the inside of you because you're now clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And now that you're walking around with the righteousness of Jesus clothing you and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, hallelujah, you got access to the grace of God. You have access to the presence of God. And that's the power of God. And when the power of God is moving and operating in your life, it's producing liberty in you. It's setting you free. It's delivering you. It's bringing you from where you used to be to a new place. Just hold on to it, brothers and sisters, even if it's not happening as fast as you want it to. Keep on trusting by faith. But it's not faith in what you do. It's not faith in what church you go to, faith in how many times you go to church, faith in what ministry you go to, faith in how much of your Bible you read, faith in none of it. It's faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. Amen. Going to church will help you learn that if you're going to a church that's teaching that. Going to a women's ministry will help you learn that if they're teaching you that. Good, opening up your Bible will help you learn that as long as you're seeing the word of God the way that he wrote it. But if you're over there thinking, oh, I'm about, to, I'm about to make myself righteous in the eyes of God. Look at all the stuff I'm doing. You, you're off the beaten trail. You're not even on the right place. Lord, help us that we would understand that. Yes, so the preaching of the cross, the message of the cross, to those that are foolish, it's, it, it, to those that are perishing, it's foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 29. Look at what he says. Verse 23, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God's not foolish and God's not weak is right. the point is, is that mankind thinks he's got something and the, the, God's little smallest amount would so much supersede anything that man could ever muster up. Yep. Yep. But the heart of this message doesn't speak power, victory or love because man associates victory. I'm talking about to the world. Because man associates victory, power, and love in a way where he is the recipient of something good. So when the natural world or the natural mind of man sees a naked man, come on somebody, help me out here, sees a naked man dying on a cross, he sees weakness. Right, right, right. He sees weakness. He sees something that doesn't want to, he doesn't want to look at because it's not pleasing to his eyes. It's not shiny. It's not new. It doesn't smell good. No, it's a naked Savior hanging bloody, dried blood, fresh blood. It's an ugly sight, and it reminds us of how bad we needed God to intervene in the midst of our situation. But thank you, Lord. He's worthy. But our mindset and our eyes have been trained to want to see things a certain way. Amen. 
That's not what the word of the Lord would say, though. God knew this. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why he let him be born in a manger among stinky animals. That's why he allowed him to ride into town on a donkey, because he knew that people like you and I, at first, we weren't going to be able to see it. He did it on purpose. I don't know what that does to your theology. That's why he spoke in parables. Hidden language that people weren't going to understand unless they really wanted to understand. See, you're, God knows. God knows where our hearts are. God knows where our heads are. He knows whenever we're trifling with him. God's not going to be trifled with. God's not going to be played with and poked around with. No, God's not going to. God's going to allow you and I to keep on going in the direction we want to. And when we're ready, oh, when we're ready, he's going to open up our spiritual eyes and ears and heart so that we can receive the truth. And it's going to be like that beautiful song where he becomes our savior. He becomes our healer. He becomes our deliverer. And I'm telling you, it's going to do something on the inside of us. It's going to convince us that he's really what we want. And what the world is offering is not what we want. Lord, help us. So when we see him hanging there. Naked on that cross, it does is not pleasant to our eyes. But look at Isaiah 53, 1 through 4. This is 600 years before Jesus was ever born. It's a perfect picture of Calvary in the Old Testament. Calvary, the hill upon which Jesus died. It says, who has believed our report? This is the prophet Isaiah. What report? The report of the Lord. Who has believed the word that we have spoken? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Do you know what an arm is? You know what the arm means? Somebody want to throw, throw me a word out there? Come on. What is it? Huh? Yes. Strength. The arm of the Lord is the strength of God. Who will believe our report and to whom will God give his arm of power to? In other words, you need strength in your life. You need power in your life. Yes, Amen. I don't know about you, but I need power in my life. Who will be revealed? Who's going to get revelation and see the power of God working in their life? Listen, this is the story of how you're going to receive that power. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Does that sound like power to you? A tender plant. You know, it's just something you just reach over there. You can break it. That's a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, it's going to look like a desert place. It's going to look like that. Because the point of this is this. God's going to receive the glory men and women of God. God's not going to allow you to receive glory. He's not going to allow the preacher to receive glory. He will not share his glory with another. It ha it, look at this. He has no form or comeliness, meaning, well, let's just go on and keep reading. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's not like, you know, I don't know if Fabio was really that good looking, but he's not like somebody like that, that we're, that's pleasant to look at. And that we're like, oh, man, you know, if you're a woman, man, that's a really good looking guy. Or if you're a man, man, that's a really attractive woman. It's not like that. Amen. And it, it was it, because to the natural eye, it didn't look good because it doesn't make sense. Because God doesn't rate things the way we do. As a matter of fact, you know, this is another truth to that. Y'all remember the story whenever David was being anointed for king? He sent the prophet over there and he told the prophet, he said, don't look at his stature, how tall he is, or his outward appearance. He said, man looks at the outward appearance. I look at his heart. Mankind is so used to looking at the outward appearance of things. And God's doing something on the inside. Look what it says in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not, or we didn't like him. We didn't, we didn't want what he offered. Surely he has borne our grief. We didn't like him, and we didn't like the way he looked, and he wasn't pretty to us, and he wasn't beautiful, but look what he did. He bore our grief. Yet, what we, what, and he carried our sorrows. That's what he's done for us. He wants to carry our sorrows. He wants to carry our grief. He wants to take away our pain. And what do we give him back in return? Yet we did esteem him stricken. He's sin of God. He's afflicted. What can he do for me? The things that are pleasing to our eyes are those things that entice us and speak of success and pleasure. And we that love God are also vulnerable to these things. Yeah. Because we live in a society that is built on these thoughts. Everyone wants to get to America. Listen to me. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but everybody wants to get to America. When you go, I've been abroad. I've been in many other countries. Now, those in Europe, they don't like us. 
Lord, help them. I, Jesus, help me. I mean, you want to be European, you can be European. And I'm not trying to be overly patriotic, but I went to Europe one time and they were like talking bad about America. And I told that French guy, I'm like, dude, you, you, you'd be speaking German right now if it wasn't for America. So you can hate us if that's what you want to do. But I'm just talking about other people in other countries. They want to get over here. Because they know, I want to live the American dream. I want an opportunity. You know, and, and listen, thank God for that. I'm so glad I was born in America. I'm so glad for the opportunities and I want to grab a hold of them and I want to run with them. But at the same time, just because the, but the, the society we live in has painted that this is what success is. That, and, and, and all I'm trying to say is, is that in the kingdom of God, that stuff isn't coming with us. This ain't King Tut. You can't bury yourself with all your worldly possessions and think you're bringing that right. stuff with you. It ain't happening. And, and we get so caught up here. Listen to me. The preacher likes nice stuff. I'm going to be honest with you. I just don't want to be ruled by it. Amen? Amen. So, so these things is what we like. I like something that shines. It looks beautiful. It pleases me. It makes me desire it. And if someone has that kind of thing, then guess what they do? They gain status in my eyes. I catch myself sometimes, man. It's like if I if I end up being end up at somebody's house for some reason, and I'm like, man, these people got some stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, like I'm talking about some real stuff because I've been been in some nice houses. I've been been around some rich folk, some real rich folk, and some of the coolest rich folk were those that started off dirt poor and built themselves up, and they like, I ain't giving you everything. Talking about their own children because if I give you everything, you're not going to learn what I needed to learn in order to get what I got to get. See, those people on that first generation that, that are self-made millionaires, they get it. They understand that all the hard work that it took to get there, you know. But anyway, sometimes I sit, I've sat in people's houses in the past. I'm like, man, these people got some stuff for real. Not like back in the day when, back in the gap when I lived in Lafayette and everybody thought they were rich and they really didn't have nothing. They were just all posers. <laughs> You know, all we dress in nice clothes and try to live above our means and we really don't have what we act like we have. Yeah. Right. No. But, you know, and, and so what I'm trying to say is, is that it's shining, it's pretty and it looks good. And it's the American success story. But that's not that's not what God's doing. Right. And when we go back to the passage that we were talking about, this message of Jesus Christ and him crucified was a stumbling block to the Jew because it doesn't make sense. Because, see, look, according to the Jewish law, a man that died by being hung on a tree, he was considered cursed. So when they viewed Jesus hanging on the tree, there was no way at that moment in time you were going to convince them that this was God's plan of salvation. That this was God's plan to deliver mankind. Because here he is, he's naked, he's weak, he's dying, he's, he's, he's bleeding out. It's not, this doesn't look like success. And, and to the and also uh, to the so to the Jewish mindset, it was a stumbling block. But to the Greek, it was foolishness because, see, to the Greek mind, they were very intellectual and they were very successful. And in their eyes, if you had stuff, you were successful and you were smart. So to the Greek mind, something that looked like power would be, oh, if you got yourself in a bind, you'd be able to speak yourself out of it. That's what they believed in. They believed in being able to talk. You so slick with your tongue, you could have taught yourself out of that thing. Or you knew somebody that knew somebody that would have got you off of that thing. Or you had enough money to get yourself out of that thing. That, that, now, now you're talking Grecian language now. Oh, okay, I'll pay attention to this guy. He talked himself out of this deal. He got out of it. Oh, I'm going to listen to him, but that's not the way God works. See, God purposely allows his love, his power, his plan to look different than what we expected because it is different. It's a completely different language. As a matter of fact, look at this. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. He says, for I see your calling, brethren. In other words, you, talking to you, brethren, you were called by God. You gave your heart to Jesus. Amen. But look what he says. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called. Meaning the people in society that we tend to look up to that have a whole lot of money in their pocket and drive nice cars and are real smart and teach in academia. And all these people that we look up to ain't too many of them people getting called to the Lord. You know why? Because they can't see it. 
because they operate operating in their natural mindset and they looking at what the world has to offer and everything just looks so beautiful and my life's good and why would I need that over there, that weak man dying on that cross? It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world. You know what base means? It means to not have parents. It's like the idea of an orphan. I mean, when you don't have when you don't have parents, when you don't have a home, when you don't have anything, you ain't got nothing. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, don't, don't, I mean we know that there are stories of orphans that have become mighty powerful people, but what I'm trying to say is, is that there's no more vulnerable in society than a child that doesn't even have parents to take care of. Yet what God is saying is, is that these are the kinds of things that I have chosen, things that look like they're nothing in order, things that are despised, God has chosen, yes, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know why it works? Because it's God's plan. He knows what pride has done to the human race. He knows what pride did to that fallen angel, Lucifer, that we call Satan. How he said he would rise himself above the throne of God. He knows how that pride entered into the human race. And that's the same spirit that was in him that would cause the Jew to stumble at the sight of the Savior on the cross. The same spirit that would cause the Grecian to allow his intellect to persuade him that something that looked ugly, dirty, and weak could not possibly result in power. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 14. He says, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. He's not talking about morally perfect. There's only one that was morally perfect. It was Jesus. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about people that are saved. He's talking about somebody that's coming to a place of completion in Christ, somebody that's growing in Christ. We speak wisdom to them that are mature in the Lord, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even hidden wisdom. God's plan is a like a hidden wisdom. It's a mystery. It's a mystery that's now able to be unfolded because of Jesus. Because when we give our heart to, G to Jesus and accept him and the spirit of God comes to live in our hearts and we read the word of God, God begins to reveal his heart to us. And while the rest of the world out there can't see it, you and I now are able to see the mysteries of God and able to see the hidden wisdom of God. Look at this, which God ordained before the world for our glory. This is God's plan. I keep trying to say it to people time and again, but God's not going to change his mind and he's not going to change his plan. The church may try to change the plan of God on how to reach the lost, but God's not going to change his plan. I've chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. I've chosen a bloody savior to save the world. This is what I have chosen and I'm not going to change. He said, which none of the princes or the high and mighty people of this world knew, for if they would have known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. But look at this. Look at how good this is. Man, I know this is a lot of information, but y'all just got to bear with me here. I'm breaking it down. Come on, bear with me. But look at this. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. The wisdom of God, the mystery of God can be revealed to you through the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Look at this. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of the man which is in him? What does that mean? How can a man really know another man? I mean, I feel like I know Troy. I feel like I know Wade pretty good. I know Gerald okay. But do I really, 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 really know? See, what I'm trying to say is, is that in the, in the heart of each one of us as men, our spirit knows more about us than what you know about us. You can think you know me, but there's, there's things on the inside of Matt that I know that I probably never even told you. Because I, I just don't want you to know. <laughs> You got enough of your own stuff that you probably ain't told me, right? Come on, somebody. I mean, I don't be looking at me all judgmental. <laughs> but nobody knows that man like the spirit that's in him. But look, look what he goes on to say. I got good news for you. Even so, the things of God, 
knows no man. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God knows God because the Spirit of God is God, right? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. I don't know about you, but that just gets me excited. I know I'm kind of a word nerd, but I'm just trying to say that God, when you got saved, put his spirit on the inside of you. Hallelujah. And now because the spirit of God resides in you, lives in you, dwells in you, he can begin to open up to you the mysteries and the hidden wisdom of God. And you can begin to learn. I'm talking about mysteries and hidden wisdom that were here before the world was ever formed. The God of glory that scattered the stars in the sky and breathed life into a lump of clay lives in you and can reveal the truth of God to you on the inside of you. What do you need from God? What kind of wisdom do you need? What kind of understanding do you need? What kind of deliverance? Do you? He's, he lives in you. He lives in you and he wants to reveal himself to you, which things also we speak not in the words of which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But look at this, verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Think about all these things that Paul is saying. And once again, this is for your own Bible study purposes. When you read letters, you got to always remember or read books in the Bible that there's an underlying context. And the underlying context is that the Corinthians live in this affluent society where sin is rampant. And these people are getting saved and they used to be some major sinners. But not only that, a lot of them had money in their pocket. And now they're coming together and they're still rich and they're still high and mighty. And they still think that they're better than everybody else. And the, whole, and the wisdom of God is completely contrary to the way that they're seeing things. And the Apostle Paul is correcting them and showing them where they're wrong and where their error is. But many of you, many of them are operating in a natural mindset that says the natural man cannot I perceive the things of God. Right. You can be a Christian and have the Holy Ghost living in you and you still operating in a natural mindset. You still looking at your physical surroundings and you're saying, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good, and completely missing the boat on what God says looks good. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Amen. So the Holy Spirit teaches us the things of God, but the man that operates in the natural, once again, cannot receive the things of God because God's wisdom, love, will, and plans are spiritually discerned. God's ways are not learned or discerned by the ways of the world, nor by natural wisdom. All right, now we're going to go back to love real quick. You ready? I'm going to wrap this up with love. Amen? Amen. Or at least with the, with the chapter of love. All right. Point number one came out of, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I mean, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 1. Point number 1 is this. When the harmony... This is good right here, I believe. When the harmony becomes cacophony. Hmm. When the harmony becomes cacophony. What are you even saying? I don't really know, but I'm about to try to break it down for you. We're talking about love, but man's love is selfish and wants something. Man's love is prideful and expects something. Man's love is puffed up and wants to be recognized. Help us, Lord. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Harmony describes when things come together. I don't know a whole lot about music, but it results in something that's very pleasant. I don't really know the right terminology, but you can have one person, I think, singing in one key and another person singing in another key. Is that the right word? Key or no? Two? Octa I don't know what it is. They're not singing exactly the same, but it comes together and it sounds beautiful. Does that make sense what I just said? Okay, you get the point. <laughs> I just know that there's a something difference between a melody and a harmony. And I know that some sounds are harmonious and they work together to produce something that's pleasant. But yet at the same time, sometimes things are not working together at all. Instead, they're coming against one another. That results in the word cacophony. It's a big old mess of a sound that's competing for one another. So what I'm trying to say is this. 
is that the Corinthian church was well known for all the gifts that were being manifested in their church. They had people speaking in tongues. They had interpretation of tongues. They had prophecy, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. But the way they were behaving towards one another showed wow. selfishness instead of sacrifice. Wow. It's not resulting in a harmony from God. It's resulting in a cacophony. When we as the children of God speak the word of God, which describes the love of God to a lost and dying world, that our behavior shows selfishness, which is the opposite of God. The message gets lost in the distortion. Nobody wants to hear the gifts of the spirit flow out of a person that's been rude to them or mean to them or selfish to them. From the mouth of that person, the words are projected from a vessel that does not exhibit the love of God. And the music of God becomes a cacophony of sound that mimics the clanging of brass. Oh, Lord, help us. Could you imagine, like, does this sound good to you? No, it's irritating. It's irritating. And whenever we are over here, and, and it goes the same for the preacher. And if I've done something or said something to you at any point in time, and let me tell you something, I'll tell you right now, buddy, I try hard not to. Yeah. You may not believe that, but even Troy, come on, Troy, you know it. Even when I say stuff to you, that, that, that I feel like if it came out the wrong way, I correct myself. I try hard. I am who I am. You're going to have to put up with me, but I try hard to make it right. All right? And all I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that when you do something that doesn't exhibit the love of God and you're over here talking, you just become like a plain of brass. It's just an irritating sound. kind of sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. We just tune them out. Lord, help us to have the harmony of God where the love of God is manifested in our life. Amen. And so therefore, people are going to want to hear what we have to say. Amen. Point number two, God's love always does what's best for you. Does your love do what's best for others? Look at verse four of chapter 13. It says, charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself. In other words, it doesn't lift itself up. So true love is not going to try to be elevated. You ever seen, I've seen a lot of preachers in my day. And I'm, I'm using a preacher, I guess, because I'm a preacher. But not just a preacher, people. I've seen a lot of preachers in my day and I'm like thinking to myself, dude, why are you so puffed up? Why are you, why are you trying to elevate yourself so much? Why are you trying to look so good in all your buddies' eyes? Why, you know, and it's just, it's a spirit that's behind people, but it doesn't just have to be a preacher. It can be anybody. You can see pe people trying to elevate themselves, trying to be puffed up, trying to put themselves first and put themselves forward to be recognized. It's something, Lord, help us to where we're more humble and we're not like that. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. You know, there's just a right way and a wrong way to act. Amen. The love of God doesn't act that way, you know? I catch myself sometimes, man. I'm not going to lie to you. I was on the phone the other day with somebody, and after a while, I was like, and I don't want to hear about you being busy because I do this, 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 and this. And one of the things I said I do was be a pastor. <laughs> I said, so I don't want to hear about how busy you are because we all busy, and guess what? We still got to get stuff done. And she said, yes, sir, you're right. And I said, but I'm sorry because you ain't got nothing to do with me. This. You just, I didn't say you're just the girl answering the phone, but I was thinking. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that that in a way was unseemly. I wasn't quite that bad, but you get the point. But, but you could be, you could be at, the, uh, at the, you know, Robert uses that a lot. You know, we go to the drive-thru and they get the order wrong. It's like, man, they ain't got my fries. Bam, put that thing in park, walk up in there. Hey, why you got my order wrong? That poor person, I don't know, you know, the other day, yesterday, I took Bella to eat. Yeah, it was Bella. She said they were in a hurry. She's in nursing school, right? They were in a hurry. They had 20 minutes for lunch. They're over there, and the girl takes this one girl's order and says, hey, can you give me one second? No, didn't finish her order. Said, give me one second. I'll be right back. She says, literally, three minutes later, she comes back. She finishes that girl's order. Then she says, no, give me five Give me five minutes. I'm going to be right back. So she goes, and like they're thinking, dude, we got 20 minutes for lunch. So the girl got aggravated. She drove up to the window, and it was the manager there. She's like, ma'am, I don't know who you got taking orders, but this girl keeps on taking a portion of our order, and then she leaves, and we only got 20 minutes for lunch. And the, and the, and the manager left the window open a little bit. She starts hollering at this girl, and the girl turns around and says, I, I'm hungry. It's less time I gotta eat. This girl was stopping in the middle of taking the order and she was like going to eat. How does that work? I don't know. I'm pretty 
Maybe you're supposed to stagger your lunches or something. Anyway, there's a right way and a wrong way to handle that. Yeah, yeah. She did wrong. She wasn't supposed to do that. But as a child of God, I'm not supposed to be unseemly. Mm-hmm. I'm not supposed to go up in there and act a fool. Right, right. <laughs> Amen? You have a right to be served properly because you're paying money. But there's a right way to handle it is the Amen. point I'm trying to make. You get the Amen. point. Y'all have all worked in service, I'm sure. <laughs> it seeks not her own. It is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. All right, real quick. Point number two. God's love always does what's best for you. Does your love do what's best for others? I want to point out three of those words, long-suffering, kind, and provocation. Number one, God is patient, long-suffering. You know, I I talk about this a lot because I think it's a very powerful word in the Bible, long-suffering. People say, what does that mean? Oh, to suffer long. Yes, but specifically in relationships. Patience is endurance in a trial. Long-suffering is endurance in a relationship. Mm. It means you might get on my nerves, but because you're my brother and my sister in Christ, by the grace of God, I'm going to endure this. I'm not going to just quit on you. You know, you might, I might do some things to you. You might do some things to me and we might be feeling frustrated with one another. But I understand that ultimately God's plan is that you and I reconcile and that we love each other in Christ. Amen. We might not always be hanging out if you just don't like me like that. I get it. But at the same time, I genuinely want to be able to love you. I don't want to be full of bitterness and frustration and anger towards another human being. It's not going to do me any good. It's going to mess up my walk with God. God is patient in his relationships with you and I. Think about all the times you failed him. But yet at the same time, how merciful is he towards you? Praise God. You and I need to be treating other people the same way. Suffer along. Give us grace. Lord, kind. God's love is sweet and soft. He is quick to forget our wrongs. But when people wrong us, we want to hold them in contempt in our mind. The wisdom of the world says that when you're wronged, you seek retribution, pain for pain. But God's wisdom says, I took the pain so that you could be released from it. God is kind. Provocation. See, when you provoke me, I respond with force and show you that I'm not somebody to be trifled with. The world's wisdom would say that to allow an offense to slide would be a show of weakness. So I prove to you through retaliation that I'm not weak. But when we provoke God through disobedience, he reminds us of his love that he showed us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. When we went to provoke God, to poke God of all people in the eye and say, hey, in spite of how much you've loved me and in spite of all that you've done for me, I'm still going to disobey you. And how does he respond? Oh, yeah, there's times of chastisement. There's times of valleys and sorrow and pain. But ultimately, how does he respond? I sent my son for you. You you, you can try to provoke me, but I sent my son for you. Amen. Amen. That's what God's love does for us. I'm going to close with this thought. The closer I get to him, the better I will be able to see. Verse 11 of chapter 13. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Think about all of the things that we covered in this message. The hidden wisdom of God. The mystery of God. The fact that God gave us his spirit so that the mysteries of God could be revealed in us so that the wisdom of God could be revealed in us. He's saying right here that that right now we're kind of like in a childlike state with our knowledge of God, but that one day we're going to grow up. And right now we see darkly, but one day we're going to be able to see him for who he really is. He says, look at this. He says, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. In a similar phase, he goes on to say this. For now we see through a glass darkly. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to have a complete understanding of God, right? He says, but then face to face. But there's coming a day when we're going to know him face to face. Now I know God in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now look at this. And now abides faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is the love of God. Now, I got to tell you what he's talking about right there specifically. He said it in another place in this particular chapter that there's coming a day when words of knowledge are going to cease. There's coming a day when prophecies are going to cease. There's coming a day when tongues are going to cease. You know why? Because there's coming a day when we're not going to need it anymore. Because when Jesus comes back and you and I become as he is and we can know him face to face, I don't know what that glorified body looks like, 
but we probably won't even have to hear words. I don't know. I'm just saying. But in the meantime, we see God, God reveals himself to us through the gifts. God reveals himself to us through prophecy, through words of knowledge, through the preaching of the gospel. But, but there's coming a day, amen, whenever those things are going to cease. But you know what's not going to cease? The love of God. Yeah. The love of God is never going to cease. And so in the words of John, the great beloved, I hope that you'll get at least this one thing out of this message. Naya, could you come play us a song on the keyboard? I hope that you'll leave with this one concept to this message. Amen. That the love of God, praise God, wants to work and operate in our lives. And that the product of his work in our lives is love. Amen. And that he wants that love to show out of us. Amen. But first he's got to produce it in us. Yes. Now you might be thinking to yourself before we worship the Lord together. Yeah, but they got this person that I don't feel like I love. <laughs> because they did me wrong. That's a real thing. That's called bitterness. And that bitterness will try to drive you away from God. Yeah. But can I tell you something? This is God's love. Yeah. This isn't, I'm not picking on nobody. This isn't Pamela's love. This isn't Jacob's love. This isn't Brendan's love. This isn't Matt's love. This is God's love. And, that's, and that means it's a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. And that means God has to produce that love in our hearts. And in order for that to happen, we have to want Him to. Let's worship the